this workshop, third session devoted to the strategies of transnational players and localization processes. And uh, uh, one of these transnational players will be studied here by Luis Albornoz. Luis, the floor is yours. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Merci beaucoup, Philippe, Christine, et Tristan, de m'avoir donné l'occasion de participer à cet atelier très riche. Uh, it's a pleasure to share with all of you uh, this workshop on digital platforms in the Global South. As an introduction to my presentation, I would like to make three clarifications. First, it should be borne in mind that we, uh, what we know as Latin America is a set of 20 countries that share some features but also possess their own differential characteristics. Therefore, referring to, to, to such a broad and diverse space can only be done by generalizing. Second, it should be known that it is difficult to work on this company, Netflix, because of its own opacity. This, of course, makes it difficult to carry out empirical studies. Finally, it must be recognized that the information and literature available is focused on the main Latin American markets. I mean, Argentina, Brazil, and Mexico, while information in medium and small markets, markets such as Bolivia, Ecuador, or Guatemala is practically not existing. Well, as you may know uh, today, Netflix is the world's leading provider of subscription video on demand services. At the beginning of the last decade, this US based company began its aggressive international expansion. And since 2016, the company is present in all countries except China, North Korea, and Syria. At the end of the first quarter of this year, Netflix had 208 million subscribers worldwide, an annual revenues of more than $20,000 billion. Latin America and the Caribbean region was the second foreign territory where Netflix venture in September 2011, one year after its initial, initial expansion to Canada. As declared in the letter to investors from the third quarter of 2011, Netflix top executives wanted to have the first mover advantage in a regional market that was going to be many times the size of the Canadian one. Netflix launch in Latin America took place in a general context shaped by both factors that favored the company's integration in the region and also factors that presented obstacles to this integration. Factors that contribute uh, to the successful uh, deployment of Netflix service include, firstly, uh, audiences accustomed to consuming American audiovisual content. This is, this is a historical presence of audiovisual American productions in the regions through movie theaters, free-to-air television, pay TV, and also uh, through informal access channels. I mean the reproduction and commercialization of films and series outside the legal market. Secondly, America Latina is a region uh, with countries with high pay TV penetration. Uh, for example, Argentina via cable TV or Brazil via satellite TV. Thirdly, Netflix was a 
pioneer company in offering a catalog of attractive titles via streaming. In countries uh, with high pay TV penetration, such as Argentina, the car cutting phenomenon did not occur. And finally, the entry of uh, Netflix into Latin American markets was without any kind of regulations. Uh, there were and are currently not audiovisual authorities monitoring Netflix performance. Against these uh, positive factors for the company, there were uh, a number of elements uh, that hindered Netflix performance, which the company itself described as infrastructure challenges. I mean, uh, a low digital device penetrations for the consumption of feature films and series via streaming, an underdeveloped internet infrastructure, a relatively low credit card usage, as well as general consumer payment challenge for e-commerce, typical for, for, for regions with a large informal economy like Latin American economy, a widespread presence of the so-called piracy of audiovisual wars, and finally, a generalized an awareness of what a streaming video on demand service was and who it worked. We must remember that the concept of subscription video on demand was nascent in Latin America 10 years ago. What do we find 10 years later? Well, Netflix has nearly 38 uh, million subscribers in Latin America, with Brazil and Mexico being its leading markets and ranking third and fourth globally, respectively. Uh, in a context marked by the pandemic and mobility restrictions, Netflix added nearly 3.6 million subscribers between April 2020 and March 2021. And you have in the slide some, uh, some uh, data about the, the, the company. For example, the, the revenues, the 837 um, uh, million uh, dollars of revenue in the, in the first quarter of these years, it is more or less about the 12% of the, the total revenues of the company. Um, regarding the pay memberships, this uh, 37.89 uh, represents more or less the 18% of uh, the total uh, number of uh, pay memberships of the company. Also, we can say that uh, a study released this year by the British consultancy firm Business Financing revealed that the company, that Netflix, is currently the most popular brand in all Latin American countries, ahead of giants such as Google or Amazon. Another study carried uh, uh, also this year by the consultancy firm Comparitech reveals that audiences in four Latin American countries, Mexico, Peru, Chile, and Argentina consumed the most hours of wars offered by, by Netflix. In addition, uh, audiences in Brazil and Colombia are above the average. We can ask ourselves what strategies developed by Netflix to reach this popular acceptance and leaderships in the Latin American territory. At the beginning, Netflix has invested in partnership with telecos and TV manufacturers, encouraging both the improvement of internet penetration and speed, as well as the increase in sales of smart TV devices. Also, at the time of, the, of its arrival in the region, Netflix only offered dubbed titles and original versions. It had to invest millions of dollars to add subtitles in Spanish and Portuguese. And Portuguese. 
agreements with major television companies for local content provisions, for example, telenovelas, were also key. Also, Netflix added titles in their catalogs that were for many years part of the local TV programming, for example, Friends, Friends in Brazil, and also distributed foreign series with exclusivity the day after their original airing in the United States. Finally, uh, we must not forget the use of innovative and aggressive marketed, marketing campaigns uh, in, the, in the main cities of uh, Latin American regions. But of course, another key activity carried out by Netflix has been and is to fit its Netflix originals. Netflix started commissioning original content only four years after its entry in the region. You have here uh, Club de Cuervos, this Mexican comedy drama is the first Spanish language Netflix original series in 2015. 3% is uh, uh, science fiction thriller and is the first Portuguese language Netflix original series and the second non-English production after Club de Cuervos. And EDA is the first Netflix Argentinian series. I choose this because this, this one, the, the first titles produced entirely in the region and also because the production of local content is concentrated in these uh, uh, three countries, uh, Mexico, uh, Argentina, um, and Brazil. For Netflix, uh, uh, sourcing exclusive titles is key. Huh? Uh, the, uh, we can say that this prompted the company to move towards vertical integration and mean and a step from distribution to production. This involvement in content productions allowed Netflix defend, to defend itself against accusations of being part of a new audiovisual imperialist crusade by arguing that its production commissions in different regions and countries contribute to a more diverse content portfolio available worldwide. In this regard, it should be noted that with its international expansion and vertical integration, Netflix has begun to employ different kinds of local resources, technical, artistic, scenic, imposing condition on its local partners. And also is, is key the use of data and algorithms, algorithms in the decisions regarding the commission of audiovisual content production. As Elia Cornelio Mari explains in her paper, Mexican Melodrama in the Age of Netflix, Algorithms for Cultural Proximity, data coming from viewers inform licensing deals and the commission of new programming. Well, overall, uh, I will venture to say that Netflix arrival in Latin America was well received, uh, both by professionals uh, in the audiovisual sector who see a chance to make themselves known to the world, as well by audiences who have a greater access to a wider range of production. However, this international expansion has also raised concerns. First, firstly, the, the composition of Netflix catalogs. I mean, the geographical origin of audiovisual productions. And secondly, the power relations established between local creators and the company. Uh, regarding catalogs compositions, sporadic studies of Netflix catalogs in some Latin American countries show that most of the titles was of US origins and that the presence of local content was marginal. 
This is a matter of concerns, concern that echoes long lasting discussions about media imperialism. And, uh, and this raises some critical voices. Uh, for example, Gabriel Levy expressed that although it is fair to recognize that Netflix has incorporated some content produced in the region, in the Latin American region, there is a notorious foreign hegemony that could put at risk the cultural identity of our countries and all their social cultural wealth. Also, uh, in Mexico, the president of the Academy of Motion Pictures, Arts and Sciences, Ernesto Contreras, asserted the need for domestic content that ensures our film sovereignty, which is not only related to an industry, but to the presence on a screen of our memory, identity, and cultural diversity, as opposed to the standardized and hegemonic views of the American industries. The second issue uh, that seems to me important to problematize, uh, and which takes us to a micro level, if you like, is that of the secret relations between Netflix and local creators. Uh, this is the asymmetric power relations between creators and Netflix regarding basic information and disputes over intellectual property rights. First of all, it should be noted that Netflix requires its partner to comply with strict confidentiality standards uh, and that as soon as the production company delivers its creation, it does not receive any information about the impact of this on the different markets. Producers have to rely on comments on social networks to get an idea of the degree of acceptance of their creations. On the other hand, as Penner and Strobar pointed out, Netflix has favored a total acquisition at a fixed price contract model in which Netflix owns all intellectual property rights for original content and creators are shut out of future profits. In the case of Brazil, these researchers know that do the structure of this market, independent production companies are at a competitive disadvantage with Netflix regarding the possession of intellectual property rights. This reveals another aspect of the asymmetric power relations involved in Netflix transnational expansion and imperialistic practices. This is according uh, Penner and Strobel. To conclude my intervention, I would like to share with you the slide, uh, uh, the, the last slide of my presentation, which shows the Colombian president uh, celebratory statement on the announcement of the opening of a Netflix office in that country. And I want to ask the following question, what to do in face of this situation? Uh, it is necessary to consider the challenge that the Latin American region faces today when confronting this new wave of US audiovisual presence, where there is Netflix, Netflix, but also Disney, Amazon, HBO. And this enormous challenge is taking place in a context marked by economic instability, as Rodrigo Gomez pointed out yesterday, and also by political polarization and institutional instability. Thank you very much, Luis. It was uh, fascinating. Uh, 